Don't you dare fucking cut it out, Ted. Good morning, Misfits. You are tuning into another episode of the Misfit Podcast. Full Goon Squad in the house. Hey, yo. Sup? Oi. On today's episode, we are going to be talking about what now? What do you do once the Open and quarterfinals end and you're staring at, I don't know how long it is, 9, 10, 11 months before you get to do this all over again? But before we do that, we'll talk a little bit about our exclusive show sponsor. You guys aren't going to be able to guess who the show sponsor is today. Uh, It's me. Costco? I'm the show sponsor. It's Misfit Athletics. Misfit Athletics is the official show sponsor of the Misfit Athletics podcast today. It's not DDK? Because Monday, April 29th is CrossFit New Year's. Hallelujah. We are restarting our affiliate programming off-season and Hatchet Off Season 1, both of those begin Monday, April 29th. If you are a gym owner or the person that is in charge of choosing your program, I suggest you get signed up for that as soon as possible so that you can take a look at the week slash month in advance and really sort of dig into the programming. Um, We've got a great podcast that has already dropped that you can check out if you want more details of what that is all about. Um, A lot of really good info, not just on the nuts and bolts of it, but how we think about it, um, how we would coach it, etc. And then the topic of today's podcast tied into what now. Um, We're going to go over sort of the broad strokes of everything and then surprise, surprise, convince you that you should be following either the strength bias track or the conditioning bias track on Hatchet Off Season 1, Monday, April 29th at MisfitAthletics.com. But yeah. before we do that as well, we just, we just got to check in. We got, a little, uh, we got a little life chat here. And I want to do life chat only to call out the fact that we don't. I don't really buy American cheese, you know, the fucking individually wrapped singles. Like you don't but purchase it or you don't buy the concept of it? I don't purchase it. It's not like, you know, I don't, think, I don't think Kraft singles are on the wall behind Sherb next to Pukey uh, anywhere in that list. Yeah, they're, they're I wish they right were. There. Um, but uh, one of my dogs has started having to take epilepsy medication every 12 hours and to hide a giant pill for a tiny dog, you need cheese. And we were giving him like grass fed organic provolone. (laughs) It was like, we're gonna fucking break the bank. (laughs) So we bought (laughs) organic fake cheese. I don't even know how that fucking works. Plant cheese? Organic but, like Ameri- organic American cheese? Yeah. Organic craft yeah. singles? That's not yes. a thing. You were, <laughs> Listen, you were I'm getting, you've been had. <laughs> well, I'm fucking well aware. Someone but, unwrapped a craft single. <laughs> hear me out. I I have like a rotation of three or four different like go to breakfasts that I make. Um and sometimes I don't go with so I'll do like four or five eggs and two English muffins. Um, and sometimes I'm like, I don't want to have to, you know, like, like cut up the egg and then dip the English muffin. Sometimes I get a little dirty and I make a breakfast sandwich. And this morning I was a little tired and I opened that drawer and there they were. It's bright fucking orange in that drawer. So fried a couple of eggs, threw some orange cheese on top of it, threw the lid on top of the pan, let it get real, real crispy like added some hot sauce and my god i feel like for a craft single it take very not, long for it to cook oh yeah, it would take eight one second i mean 2. i know seconds Holy i know those shit. individually wrapped singles are those made of plastic melt. but the milk <laughs> factor on them is so good it's it crazy smash burger, they're so amazing gooey. yeah i mean a smash burger is the that's like what you got to do yeah that's part it's of like it. not it's literally not it goes from not being good at all to being <laughs> fucking incredible <laughs> Yeah. Like if I just ate that, I would be that. like, "What is this? I don't understand." How long do you think it would take hot to sauce, mold if you left it out? Couple on the of eggs. Oh man, you think it would ever Damn. mold? It's organic, Ted. <laughs> I'm sure organic. I don't I understand. Had a, <laughs> I had some leftover singles in my fridge for 
oh, from stripping a while. Uh, <laughs> and they were not moldy. They actually just dr- started to dry out. I think they it just started to get like a little bit hard um, before. It's like a floppy disk. It didn't. Yeah, it didn't. It didn't grow mold. It just started to dry out and get a little. Do you eat it? Turgid. Bro, that's called I mean, aged. You should have ate that. Waste it's not, aged. want not. <laughs> American singles. How did it melt yeah, after aged, it dried aged, out? Aged American cheese. Aged mm. aged in the fine zip code of <laughs> Allen Ave and fucking <laughs> a, aged Allen Ave American cheese. Fuck, you could have sold that on eBay. Probably for right? $15 a slice. Fuck. I'll try. <laughs> what what would could. you say is the worst thing that you eat health-wise on a regular basis? LSD. Oh, sorry. Oh, on a, on a regular <laughs> basis. I mean, I guess I, semi-regular. That, there's no way that's the worst. <laughs> no, there's no chance. Yeah, it's defi- yeah, if it's not on a regular basis, it's definitely candy. Like, I'm still such a candy slut. I love candy so much. <laughs> I, was gonna, I, was um, talk, I was talking to Bobby yesterday about this, and he's like, yeah, I bought 25 boxes of like Thin Mints and Girl Scout cookies and whatnot. And he's like, do you buy those? And I was like, yeah, I'm the kind of guy, if I buy a box of Thin Mints, like it doesn't matter how many boxes I buy, I'm going to eat them all at once and I'm going to shit black water because I hate so many of them. I'm going to shit black water because I've eaten three boxes at once. Are you a Girl Scouts in the freezer kind of guy oh, or? Fuck yeah. What the yeah. fuck? Yeah. Yeah. Clip that. Oh, yeah, you put them in the fuck freezer. yeah. You little Leave it, yeah, just People are really that. into that Leave kind it. of content these days. Bro, get yourself some peanut butter frosting and dip those fuckers in there. Amazing. Peanut butter frosting? What is that? Yeah. So just a jar peanut of peanut butter, butter? frosting. Just peanut butter. <laughs> peanut just peanut butter frosting. Butter? Yeah, I don't understand. <laughs> they sell that like shit in a fucking like a you know, like they would vanilla frosting at the fucking fat boy aisle. All right. I, I'm lucky <laughs> enough to have a niece that's of Girl Scout age, so we perpetually have cookies in the house, like boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes. Fuck, I'd be so them. strung out. We we basically never run <laughs> this out. This conversation with Girl long. Scouts and cookies is getting fucking weird, boys. Well, I'll be fucking <laughs> strong. Only if you make it weird, Hunter. Only if you Got make st- it weird. strung out these Girl Scouts. <laughs> what what <laughs> is... Same, what, that's a good question, though. I want everyone to answer on a regular basis. What that would probably be weekly, I'd say. What is the most unhealthy thing that you eat on a regular basis? I might have an easier God, time mine's, answering mine's what so the fucking whack. thing is because most of what I eat is not... Probably so crumb, Girl Scout it's, it's cookies probably at like my, 11 p.m. Probably yeah, close sure. to my almost weekly crumble cookie stop. Weekly? Probably the, you back on the cookies guy? Not. Uh, it's it's <laughs> probably like. Definitely back on the cookies. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably like every other every other week on average. It, it depends on whether I go out to dinner or not on Friday night. But if I do, <laughs> I usually stop at crumble on the way home. Atta a girl. Um, I'd say because Zion is obsessed with popcorn, I make just plain popcorn and then I like literally take an entire thing of Kerrygold like the fucking brick cut it in half what'd you say I fell down. asleep that's yeah, the most exactly. unhealthy you. thing you eat is popcorn yeah what's wrong with popcorn it's got fiber in it you just put like 400 pounds of butter and salt on it yeah. you like get done your whole shirt's covered in grease it's fucking yeah. sloppy yes it is I would say either uh, cookies or cereal for me I'm a big cereal whore I love a good mm. cereal I yeah. like uh, even magic spoon honey bunches of oats is one of my favorites <laughs> but I don't just do honey bunches of oats there's probably a couple tablespoons of honey on there maybe some chocolate chips a little bit a little bit whipped cream what? <laughs> ice cream you if I got it shit. Yeah. Yeah. that's that, <laughs> that's amazing that's just, I love that's, that that's, <laughs> mel- that's melted honey nut Cheerios ice cream Dad. that's not cereal hey, <laughs> just, it works to each his own it gets the job done <laughs> and I'll, fr- I'll put it in the freezer so it hardens <laughs> and then I well know, that's kind of a good idea yeah <laughs> that's ice cream uh, mine's a rotation of tastery chicken cookies <laughs> chips and macaroni and cheese because I don't buy those things but Maya buys them for me and I complain when she doesn't and complain when she does. <laughs> um, so yeah, I would say those are the, those are the big three. Like if she's going away and I have like, I'm doing some fucking solo dadding. There's a lot of macaroni and cheese <laughs> chips and cookies in the house. She knows, she knows that I'm going to go eat my feelings once the, once the baby goes. Bro, to you bed. introduced your kid to mac and cheese yet or what? You feed him the no, mac and cheese? No, we haven't. He hasn't had... Other than trying it, he hasn't had much like actual dairy yet. Mm. We we haven't gotten into that. He eat he liter he eats the fucking Glassman's food pyramid. He has the best yeah. diet Two of almonds? I've ever met in my life. It's like <laughs> one block almonds, avocado, some form of either egg, chicken, bison, salmon, fruit, 
vegetables, like probably the most unhealthy thing he eats is gluten-free sourdough bread. That's like $400 per square inch. It's shipped in from the Himalayas. <laughs> <laughs> right. Is he, is he have a celiac or any like, can you test for so that? So definitely Maya and I both have the gene. Um, he had the jackpot. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so he'll definitely have that, but that doesn't mean he'll have the mutation that causes him to have celiac so he has had all major allergens so far he's had some skin reactions to stuff but nothing serious do babies just have allergies to everything until they're old enough to not have allergies anymore is it like they can build their immune system up to not be allergic to the world yes and no like you wouldn't want to overload them with things that are slowly like have <laughs> higher allergen like counts in them hmm. like for instance i think cashews are the number one Shrimp like cocktail highest allergen <laughs> that there is so lobster you, tail cashews. I think most babies would have a fucking problem if you gave them like cashew butter five days a week um but yeah it does That's sort of Lincoln's sort of work is. that way one of the reasons Sorry. why there's a like <laughs> epidemic of allergies is because parents avoid the foods and then I was going to say, isn't it like preferable to expose your kid in like correct. appropriate to doses to that stuff? Everybody's yeah. got peanut allergies because everybody's terrified of giving their kid peanuts. Right. How do you test the opposite Do you like situation. rub it on the, their skin and see what happens? or Right into their cornea. Just open your <laughs> eyes. I mean, it's very eyes. unscientific. <laughs> <Yeah>. Doctors like, <laughs> like stare at them for 15 to 30 minutes after you give them the food and see if anything changes. Just and one peanut and eat not each nostril. It's weird too. He's not breathing. Like, it's not good. Is he okay? I don't Choked him out. know. He looks somewhat normal. Maya's usually convinced that he's going to like spin off the planet and rocket through the ceiling into the sky if he has something like that. She's like, that'd be cool. That? She thinks he's going to get right? superpowers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's fucking Jack Jack. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Quarterfinals has ended. We have come to that point in the year again where a lot of people sort of ask, now what? What do I do? Open is over. Quarterfinals is over. Um, your ego is sitting in the back screaming, we're a triathlete now. We're a weightlifter now. Let's go after some bodybuilding. Yogi, will return. Ooh, a yogi. I like that. Yeah, you I'm will return um, that makes to younger. the dark side. You will join us <laughs> once again at some point in the off season. And I personally think it's really important for athletes to get started right away, but in a very manageable dose. Um, I think it builds in the idea of like smaller things done really well over the course of the entire season creates a really good athlete, not the ebbs and flows of like that didn't go well. So I'm going to go all in right away and attack a ton of volume. And then you realize in the summer that you're burnt out and you're not sort of ready to, to take on an entire off season. So I really like the idea of an athlete taking the time that they need post quarterfinals, you know, but the volume of it was not very high. So we could be talking about less than a week, but just having a bit of a reset there. Um, that's why currently on our website, you're, you know, you're seeing the, the phase zero type stuff is what we call it. We're talking misfit benchmarks and one at max lifts and stuff like that. Um, or you're taking a, you know, we have some suggestions in there for you to take an affiliate class or chill out or go for a jog or a bike ride or do what you got to do. Um, yeah, hobby for a day or two. It's okay. <laughs> How do you guys think about this? Obviously, you have context in a bunch of different areas. Sure, you're still into the competitive side. Hunter, you <laughs> could be if you wanted to. Um, sometimes you dabble, sometimes you don't. Um, you are affiliate coaches in, you know, we had between both gyms, we had 50 athletes qualify um, and your remote coaches. So, I think you guys see it from quite a few different perspectives. When when something like this ends and we have that bookend on the season for whatever it is, ninety nine percent of people, how do you how do you see that? I think it's the quote you always say, Hunter, if you're always on, you're never on kind of vibe. So hey, chill the fuck out because I'm gonna show you a receipt that you uh created at one point during the year where you're I'm tired, I'm bored or I'm hurt, or I don't feel good, or I'm, I don't have the vibe there. I'm like, you remember this? This is you telling me you need to chill. This is the time to do that. This is the time to get healthy and to retool intensity and be okay with doing a workout or a workout in a skill and then getting out and doing other things in your life. Like we're so far away from the season. And if you can't 
chill the fuck out, you can't ever turn it back up. That dial has to be able to go up and down. And if you always try to keep it up, it slowly over time, slowly turns backwards and you just can't keep going. Yeah, I think um, I, I, I know you're kind of true your comment of I'm a weightlifter now, I'm a triathlete now, I'm a underwater basket weaver now, whatever <laughs> uh, might have been said in jest. But I think there is there's a little bit to it as far as like, obviously not that what drew is alluding to is like this i hate crossfit like it, things didn't go as well i'm gonna go do something completely different because i quit crossfit that's not not what uh or that's kind of what he's alluding to i'm suggesting like maybe do one of those things if it's something that you like to do i think the like overarching theme is like take some time to go do um whether it is training related or you know, or, or go, you know, learn and play a new sport. I think that's probably one, one of those things that often falls by the wayside, especially for the level of athlete we're talking about here, whether you're, you know, an affiliate athlete who really got bit by the CrossFit bug and, and your fitness was able to carry you to, you know, through quarterfinals, good on you, terrific. Um, but like CrossFit, is not necessarily meant to be, you know, for the, for the 99% for folks who aren't going to make this a living or turn, uh, you know, turn it into something where like, I'm really dedicating time and energy to getting to an extremely high level. Like that's not most of us. That's that, as a matter of fact, that's a, an extraordinarily small proportion. And we have to remember that kind of the intent behind CrossFit was to create a, a superhero of a person um, who's fit for life, but there are also some other nuances snuck into kind of the methodology that get forgotten about the, you know, top of the pyramid behind Sherb is, you know, sport. Uh, regularly learn and play new sports is one of the hundred words of fitness. And um, we talk about it a lot of the time when with athletes who um, maybe folks who whose primary athletic experience in life has become CrossFit compared to someone who has a more traditional athletic experience or would maybe cl be classified more as, quote, an athlete versus a, you know, just straight up CrossFitter. And I don't think um, that, you know, your average everyday person takes advantage of the fitness average everyday person average everyday crossfitter takes advantage of their fitness in such a way that they go out and you know learn and play a new sport or take on something different for you know in, in the context of this conversation maybe it is only a couple weeks or a month or something like that of of trying something different uh, or you know just kind of taking a step outside the gym and saying like hey one twelfth of the year is not going to hurt me. And as a matter of fact, it's probably going to allow me to reset both mentally and physically, uh, and probably, uh, make a more informed decision about how I'm going to go about training for this upcoming year, because odds are, you know, right after quarterfinals, your, uh, your kind of emotions and your psychology is colored by the workouts that were, you know, doled out and where your placement was. And that's not necessarily a good time to make a, an informed decision about what you need to work on or, uh, and probably just isn't also the time to like immediately get right into that thing. Like let's take a little bit of time to, to reset and recover and then, you know, have a more directed approach once you kind of get back into the gym. Got to do GHGs yeah. every day. One of the hallmarks of the, the, upcoming program um is quite a bit of running and i think that we've talked about it before in a bunch of different contexts but the idea of like it's summertime we want to get you out of the gym we want to get you into potentially the greatest place for you to express your fitness um i think i think there's something really cool about being able to move the needle with like on for instance, in, in hatchet off season one, day one for the conditioning biased athletes is always going to be a long run in there. And I think, I think that can do a lot physically and mentally for an athlete to like 
have the ability to walk outside of the gym um, and not be as bogged down in your 21 15 nines and and go for a jog um, you hit some high rep back squats and you go out and run and you sort of get back to the basics and and reset things and are less locked in on like i don't know there's there's something very different about the training and testing stimulus and that shift that you've had to do over the the last few months like what's the absolute best way to game this workout um and I think it's cool that that we can sort of reset that whole thing um, and and get to work on things that um, move the needle from a potentially different place more in line with the basics of strength and conditioning. It's a foundation that you need to build on for the rest of the season. If you're not addressing the way you move and you're not paying attention to your metabolic conditioning and you know you continue to move things the way that you have been historically, you, you might not make the leap you're looking to make the following year. Truth. So when we're looking at moving forward and deciding which avenue to take within the program, um, if you're not familiar with what we do for the first two phases in the off season, you're going to have the opportunity to choose for hatchet off season one, which is seven weeks long, and then hatchet off season two, which is seven weeks long whether you want to be on the strength bias track or the conditioning bias track. Um, and the method in which you choose um, is like honestly pretty damn clear when you look at leaderboards. So if I go to my leaderboard for the open and quarterfinals, the strength bias track is kind of the easiest one to notice. You see a level of consistency from workout to workout over the course of open and quarterfinals, like I finished 200th in this workout and 275th in this workout. And maybe you had a wheelhouse one where you were 150th, whatever it is. And then that heavy barbell is 400th, 500th, 600th, 700th. Maybe you took a thousand points in one of those things. Um, that is when you would want to be on the strength bias program. That is how you audit that. And I think there's a lot of confirmation bias for these sorts of things based on like, I want to see this pattern within my leaderboard because I do want to do the strength bias track. Um, and that's something that we would want you to try and avoid on the conditioning side. Um, one, one super easy way to look at it would be what you just said is not me. <laughs> If that's the case, then you need to be on the conditioning bias track. Um, now, more specifically, when you are auditing those results, you would see um, one of the one of the examples that I like to give is I am strong or I am skilled or there's there are these pieces of the puzzle that I'm good at. And when we get forced into super high intensity and I can't keep up with the people that I want to. Um, that is a very clear sign that we just need to raise GPP as much as possible, which will happen much easier with one lift and two conditioning pieces versus the opposite. What would you guys say is the maybe split? You have a hundred hatchet level athletes deciding what to do. What is the split between strength bias versus conditioning bias? How many, if every athlete chose the correct thing, what do you think that split would look like? 85-15. Which one? I was thinking I was thinking 80-20. <laughs> conditioning, conditioning 80%. more conditioning than strength. Yeah. What do you think? I just I don't know that I would have gone quite that steep, probably closer to like 70-30. 70. 70 <laughs> yeah, 70-30, yeah, something like that. I think it also really heavily depends on like I feel like a broken record saying this, but like the off season as well, or like this gap period, maybe while you are prioritizing like recovery and maybe injury, you know, recovering from injuries that have been nagging for long enough where you could, you kind of got, you kind of were able to grind through it. But now that the season's over, like let's like actually address those sorts of things. The one, the thing that will inevitably get swept under the rug is your piss poor mobility. Like, you weren't hey, able to put your hands you, over your head last year and you couldn't do it this year and you did the same thing because you didn't work on it. And I think that's our, especially for athletes who um, struggle with the Olympic lifts, 
like in particular, just because of the mobility demand relative to say a deadlift or, or even a back squat, although non-zero is like, we, we, we are always, for the most part, we are trying to help athletes work with the mobility and kind of ranges of motion that they currently have. We don't, as a company, just because we, you know, we're programming workouts, we're not a mobility wad or a, or a ROM wad or a, a, the ready state, not mobility wad. Um, but like Liability, those things, <laughs> those things are like massively foundational and are pretty much swept under the rug by every CrossFitter. It's just like, nope, this is like my that arms go, it. my arms go this far overhead and that's what I'm working with. It's like, like, bitch, if you, if I told you your back squat is where it's at and you, and I, and then you, and I was like, no, nah, it's just not going to get any bigger. It's not going to get any heavier. You'd be like, no, fuck off. Like I'll do a back squat twice a week and I'm going to see that number go up. But it's like, Hey, if your overhead mobility were a little bit better, that snatch would be, you'd add 20 pounds to your snatch. Most people are just like, nah, probably not. I'm just not going to do that. And like, <laughs> what's the snatch program? It's like, that's fine. I'll just go fuck myself. I'll definitely, definitely don't know what we're, what we're talking about there. And folks constantly <clears throat> are, are compensating for poor movement patterns. And more often than not, the poor movement patterns that people have are a result of poor mobility. Obviously there's a, like you learn to do the movement incorrectly or, uh, you know, you're, you didn't have a, you didn't have a good coach, didn't have a good affiliate coach, whatever, however you learn the movement, there's obviously a motor pattern element to that. But uh, especially for folks who maybe didn't have like a, an athletic background or didn't play a lot of sports growing up. Like if you, if you're generally desk bound, like the odds that you have ideal mobility are pretty low. I'd put it in that 70, 30 camp. Um, and that's like, this is again, another thing to be thinking about while, you know, Hey, we don't need to dedicate a tremendous amount of intensity to our training for this like short period of time, but you can improve things that are going to move the needle for you longer, further down the road. Hunter, what does that accessory to... column say? See, you're in that sheet. What does that accessory column I'm say? In that sheet, <clears throat> mobility slash stability. And Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, we're live. I, hey, people are listening to this. <laughs> barefoot squat. Oh, you want me to? Oh, sorry. Five minute barefoot <laughs> squat hold, preferably before back squat session. Five minute pull up bar dead hang. Five minute handstand hold. Five minute barefoot. 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 <laughs> Five minute barefoot. Yeah. Say? Figure it out. Basically, some holds. Squat hold, yeah. dead hang, handstand hold, like. I don't know, move foundational basics. Yeah. yeah, move the needle on. Like That's one of the things where if you actually, if an athlete actually committed to squat holds over the course of an entire off season, um, I mean, the, the amount of change that we can get from low-hanging fruit like that, honestly with pretty high level athletes that come to us for remote coaching it's like you're gonna you're gonna pop up you're gonna pop your shoes off sit down in the bottom of a squat until yep. you don't care anymore um and and those are things that like at this point in the year so non-negotiable like if we are gonna say that we're we're going after the basics and we're sort of retooling for another year and you're not hanging from a pull-up bar hanging out upside down or sitting in the bottom of a squat. Yeah, not to direct people away from like our stuff, but ultimately like, yeah, those mobility stability things are terrific, but there's so many resources out there for free, oh, like on YouTube. Um, like that, that's where I learned most of the like mobility techniques that in the book, you know, K-Star's book, but like those, just because it's not in the program doesn't mean it's not like a crucial element to what you're doing. Uh, and like part of that is kind of digging in on your own and finding, you know, it's like, why, why is my, you know, why is my range of motion overhead limited? Why is my squat depth limited? Why are my ankles tight? Whatever it is. And like actually digging in and trying to find a solution or a, you know, a way to move the needle in that regard is going to do so much for you in the long term. You look at Truth. the strongest people in our sport. And just look at what they can do in terms of putting their bodies in positions. You know, you look at someone like Gee, you look at someone like Tola, um, just their mobility. They're able to get in positions Frazier, you can't. Froning, all of them. Ben I mean, Smith. They're, they're, 
yes, they're extremely strong and yes, they have a crazy engine, but what allows them to do what they can do is they can put in positions that you can't. And that's the reason why they can get in better positions and, you know, why if the games are attempting 400 pound overhead squats and you're attempting 200 pound overhead squats. Like, hey. obviously, some of it is strength. Hey, hey. you get 205. Um, some of it's strength, but a lot of it's just position. That's better. Yeah, I mean, I like when I used to try to compete, I realized that that was like my only chance within those things. I could get into significantly better positions than other athletes and I could lift a similar amount of weight as them without being as strong or as fit. Um, and the idea that you would gloss over something like that when you're trying to get better at the sport is kind of silly. Um, it's wicked silly. So one element of this whole picture when you're thinking about getting better over the course of an entire off season um, is obviously I want to get stronger, fitter, and more skilled. That is the objective of every single program that is out there as what they are trying to, to get done. One interesting element of that is that if you are an open and or slash quarterfinals athlete, they don't ask you to be very good or to be good at very many things. The list is pretty short. Um, and one great thing about the list is it's kind of simple too. It's not very complicated. It's very foundational, functional movement patterns. And what's great about that is we can use those movements to get stimulus. We can use those movements to make sure that we are prioritizing what you are getting out of the workout due to their simplicity. And then we can get you the level of exposure in those movements to improve over the course of the entire season, not only in your efficiency and how easy it is, what the cost of each rep is to you, um, but also your athlete IQ. We think about variance to the point where it's like you will do toes to bar and double unders and power snatch and burpees and deadlifts in combinations where it's a cardio type workout. It is a gas tank workout. It is a muscle endurance workout. They will be coupled with different things. You'll have to row before you do toes to bar. You'll have to do all of these different things and you're getting the exposure. You're getting stronger, fitter, and more skilled. And you can, if you take good notes, you can go back and look at how certain things ran interference or how hard can I row in this piece when I have to get off the, get off the rower and deadlift and double under immediately and get right back on and all of those things. Um, it does not need to be complicated. Like the, the program itself, especially at this time of year, stimulus is so incredibly important. Um, if you get bogged down in, I'm doing single crossover muscle up, pistol rope climb you know whatever you want to call it handstand ramp all of those things if we start to do those things under intensity quote unquote intensity um at this point in the year we're not really understanding how you can move the needle we need you to lift either really heavy weights or reps or high rep um, moderate weights or we need you to be a technician with the barbell in positional work and we need you to slowly improve all of your energy systems through things like bitch work and workouts that are like deadlift, kettlebell, swing, bike. Like you can go in Active. and really move the needle <laughs> on these things. And that's what we, that's what we're after at this point in the season. The more complicated shit should be separated out from the program so that you can focus on what you need to focus on. I think people need to understand that movements, the higher skill type movements serve a purpose, but the farther away they get from, you know, workouts designed to elicit increased work capacity across broad time and modal domains don't have a, it's not that they don't have a place, they just have a a very specific place for a very specific purpose. And ultimately, like we could rewrite any of these quarterfinal workouts with different movements and achieve the same stimulus and arguably, you know, achieve the same thing as far as what we wanted to test. The difference is just like the manner in which we, you know, choose those movements. We don't need to, we're not going to find the fittest person on earth by programming strict muscle ups, you know, 
cartwheels and crossover quadruple unders we need to we need to find we find the fittest people or crossfit and crossfit finds the fittest people by doing the basic movements the thruster box jump wall ball pull-ups the movements that once you learn how to do them which for most of us like listening to this podcast we have we have you know it probably 95 to 100 percent of the skills that crossfit requires after that it becomes developing your fitness in such a way that you can actually you know execute those movements at the intensity desired there are not very many tests that crossfit puts out that are exclusively meant to test things like you know there's always the handstand walk thing. There's always the hand, it's like the handstand rock walk obstacle course. And lo and behold, Daniel Brandon wins it every year because she's extremely good at that very specific thing. And not to, and that's not to shit on her fitness or skill level, but it's like, and that's also one out of the 13 to 17, however many tests the CrossFit game puts games put out, because that is not fitness as a whole right it's good to be able to have those skills because skill is part of the is is part of fitness but it's certainly not the preponderance of fitness and we move the needle by keeping those movements you know keeping them simple which means there's no reason for you to not be able to do them unless your fitness isn't up to par difficulty will blunt the adaptation if your shit is too difficult you cannot go hard enough to get these stimulus provided and thus you are wasting your time to check a box that doesn't actually move the needle in the direction that you're hoping your fitness will go. So, you know, PSA here, if you're doing shit that's really hard and you can't go hard in the thing, like yes, a 365 deadlift is hard, but the fittest people move that at a certain speed. And if you're not moving at the same speed, you're not getting the same workout. So it's not as effective for you. Go down to 275, go down to fucking 185 if you have to. But the, if it's too difficult, it will blunt the adaptation you're after. You're explaining exactly how someone could work hard all off season and end up in a very similar place. Sure. Like you could yeah. maintain fitness by doing what you're talking about, by training the exact same way year round, you could stay relatively fit. Um, but the way that the sport progresses, if you were to do that, you would slide down the leaderboard little by little year after year and wonder what the fuck is going on. Um, <clears throat> so what can you expect in a hatchet off season one? If you follow the strength bias program, very simply put every single day, you will have two lifts and accessories and one conditioning piece. If you follow the conditioning track, you will do one lift and one accessory and two conditioning pieces. Now, one important thing here is that one lift and one conditioning piece will overlap within both of both programs. So we're going back to the fucking genesis of Misfit Athletics. How is it possible to write programming for the masses when we know one size fits all is not possible, but training by yourself is not fucking CrossFit. Like I'm the only one in the fucking world that does this specific little program. Um, that is a lonely pursuit. And we find that it just doesn't really work within the same way. We even had games athletes back in the day that were like, can you please make the rest of the misfit community follow games prep so that we're not alone so that I can compare scores with everyone. It's like, well, I don't know if that's exactly how we want to do it. But, um, so that's what you can expect from this program. The, Biggest changes from last year, if you followed last year, is we gave you more of the like a la carte feel. You're going to do these lifts and then choose this conditioning piece. You're going to do this or you're going to choose the lift and then do these conditioning pieces, depending on which one you're on. Um, this year, you do not choose at all. Um, you choose which track you're on and then you go in and get the work done. Um, and that's based on some feedback of we like the variable training system, but sometimes the decision fatigue is a little bit too strong for me. Like I do want the choice of what I'm going to bias, um, but then I want to get to fucking work. I want you guys to tell me what to do and I want to get to work um, and building it out over the last few months and, and taking a look at what some someone is going to execute on both of them. Um, 
it was much easier for me to write what I felt was like very effective. Like, eh, this wouldn't be a very good choice on this day for this program. Um, and I think it made it easier for us to go in and not worry about, oh, are they going to choose this piece that's probably going to hinder what they're doing? So um, that would be the main difference that you'll see if you did follow this last year. And that actually in my head makes me think about your question again, Hunter, in terms of the split. I think, I think I'm thinking of two separate groups. I'm thinking of misfits who followed the program last year um, and followed it in the way that we sort of put out there. You could be looking at something closer to like a 60, 40, um, someone coming in from the general public, like we're going to turn five. our, I mean, yeah, we're, we're I think we're up to the 80, 20 in the general population sure. just because I don't think I know enough about other programs to know that what we ask you to do on the conditioning side is no fucking joke year round. Like that's what our sport is. Um, and we make sure that you learn how to lean into that and see progress with that. So I think misfits potentially closer to 60, 40. And then if you, if you haven't followed our program before, um, the strength bias program might feel like it's conditioning bias anyways, because of sort of what we ask you to do there. Um, a place where you will also see crossover and do get more choices, um, much more similar to what we ask throughout the entire year for you guys to do is the skill. Um, so the way that we did the skill in hatchet off season one is there are five different skills over the course of a week, five training days. Um, and we want you to choose anywhere from, if you're an open athlete, you don't have to choose any, but quarterfinals athletes, I'm looking for one to three skills to lock in on. Like maybe something like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, something of that nature, where you are going to take the time to add in a skill and you're going to have a seven week progression on that particular skill. So we have muscle ups, handstand walk, bar pull, which is just alternating back and forth between chest to bar and bar muscle up toes to bar and handstand push up. Those are five slash six movements that are on that list that they ask you to be very proficient in. And I would like athletes to choose again, anywhere from like one to three of those things and lock in on them for seven weeks. Take the extra time by not doing all five of them to like really think about the way that you're moving, to think about what you would want to see from the progression over the seven weeks. Like how am I actually going to get get better at this thing than being like, okay, I'm going to get better at all of them at once. Are those things on the same day weekly? So let's say I go in Correct. Monday, April 29th and I see muscle up misfit sets of muscle up skill work. I can probably bank and like, okay, I do need to work on my muscle ups. I can bank that every Monday I'll be doing some muscle ups. Correct. Yes. Approved. <laughs> Thank you. I was going for this. <laughs> um, so we talked about stimulus as king, especially this time of year. That's already been brought up. Um, running and biking. Uh, it is running and biking season where we are. Um, that is not always the case. Um, and if you were going to pick something that moves the needle a lot, not necessarily like I think I think if you're comparing running and biking to something like rowing, rowing might be a very incredible expression of fitness, but I think I can make you a better rower in, I don't know, January, February by having you really set the tone with can you move your body through space and can you, you know, the name of the game in CrossFit so often is can you flush waste in your lower half? Like, can you not have fucking lead in your legs every single time they ask you to do something that's either super high rep or super high intensity? Those are those are two skills that um, are non-negotiable, even though they don't necessarily show up directly sort of like in the strength where you think about the back squat doesn't really show up in the sport, that sort of thing. We can really get you much, much, much fitter and much better at lower body endurance which is incredibly important through running and biking and you're gonna see a whole fucking lot of it here in the next seven weeks and then spoiler alert the next seven weeks for hatchet off season two 
I never would have guessed all summer running and biking. Mm -hmm. Get outside. Get a road bike. Experience nature. Yeah, I don't think there's another m movement that m can move the needle quite the same way that running can of, of all different intensities whether it's a mf2 sort of pace where you might even be some of you might even be borderline walking or true thumbs down how dare you what <laughs> oh come on i'm just gonna show up. up um whether it's a slow run or you know we're asking you to go to to sprint or run extremely hard i don't i think the what drew alluded to with the moving your body through space is just there's just something that's like there's a reason people would almost always prefer to sit on a bike instead of go running if given the option. It's like, I can stay seated, I can be in one spot, and I can take advantage of the fact that, like, I can, I'm can i just pushing down on the pedals versus I'm actually traversing my entire body mass through space, putting joints through, you know, the tension that and the and the stress that kind of comes out of running. There's just no better way to do it. And I would ag I would agree. Like I can get you I get if you have a strong like base of fitness that is developed via running, I can get you on a rower and I can get you pretty comfortable on that rower, understanding that your paces are gonna be a little bit faster because of the fitness that you developed running. You can get, and don't get me wrong, like the only reason I would say it would be difficult to go in the other way, like sp stick you on a rower 99% of the time and then on the road 1% of the time is because there's still the impact, the difference in in bodily impact that occurs on the road versus on a rower. Um, and it's just, it's just a little bit different. But from a fitness perspective, like it's pretty cheap too. You just need some shoes or maybe not. Go on the grass. Get out there and pound the pavement. Get in the nature. It's also a very useful bridge between monostructural conditioning and CrossFit. So if we take monostructural conditioning on one side, we call it bitch work here at Misfit Athletics, um, you get a, a screen in front of you. Like you are told immediately, like I know that my sixth gear on the rower is a 140 and I start off either at a 159 or a 129 that seems fucking stupid, right? You still feel fresh and you feel good and, and you could be tricked if someone dropped the monitor down and you couldn't take a look at it. In CrossFit, you are not typically, unless unless it's a super rowing forward workout, afforded that opportunity. You have to go based on feel. You have to understand the totality of the workout. You need to know things like, how long do this many of these take and this many of these and what's the time domain and what's the stimulus and how am I going to attack this? And running is interesting sitting in the middle because you feel that same thing that you feel in a Metcon. Like how fucking lovely is the first 112 meters of a jog? Fucking <laughs> too many alive. You, you fucking want some meters. of this. You don't stand a chance. Like you feel good when you go for a run at the very beginning, whether you're, you know, doing 400 meter repeats all the way out to that zone two type of run. Um, but it's a single modality. It's one thing to focus on. It's one thing to say, I understand what my body is trying to tell me here. And I do suggest that people think about it from that perspective and play stupid little games with themselves of like, yeah, I do have this watch that's going to tell me what my pace is and what my heart rate is. Why don't I guess? Why don't I go run for 200 of the 400 and be like, I think this feels like a, like a zone four ish kind of situation staying below threshold. And I'm probably running at a 742 mile or something like that. And then take a look at your watch. Um, not only does it give you an opportunity to guess and check what you're doing and then translate that feeling into CrossFit, um, it also might take your mind off of the fact that you are putting one foot in front of the other for anywhere from 90 seconds to 45 minutes. Yeah, and I think that aspect of it as well, like almost for the opposite reason, is what makes running so effective. Like you can, you can sit on a machine and especially like in mid-CrossFit, type workout you know five rounds of a or 20 minutes of row deadlift double under say the like the open workout where you can sit on a rower and you can be pretty fucking sad 
and be accumulating distance or accumulating meters or calories. You can sit on a bike and bike pretty sad and still kind of recover. When you're running, like you're outside pounding the pavement, like you're still one moving your body through space. And if you're doing it slowly, you're going to be doing it for a lot longer. Uh, and if you stop running, you are accumulating zero distance, right? Like that same minimal effort is not, you know, you might as well be walking outside, which isn't what we're after. So um, I think running just provides that a different stimulus. And to your point, Drew, the op the opportunity to really kind of be in tune with how you're feeling pace wise and having like kind of l developing the skill and ability to temper your pace in a, in a workout without having the advantage of seeing the clock that's right in front of you. Cause odds are the clock is inside, you know, the bay doors while you're pounding the pavement outside. Uh, so you don't have a, you don't have a heads up display, like a rower monitor. You don't have a clock to tell you, you've just got what you have to kind of the one foot in front of the other and the feeling of, you know, is my heart rate too high for this type of workout at this point in the workout or am I too comfortable and I need to actually pick up the pace a little bit to to shave some time or gain some reps do you guys know any really good crossfitters or bad runners like bad runners that they got that are good and you know their name I know crossfitters really good crossfitters who could be a lot better at running and would therefore be a lot fitter but I absolutely agree there but do you can you think of any really good CrossFitters? Who we don't, are just Ro trash? Roman already said Ro Roman already said all of it in that podcast, right? He called out everyone who sucked at running and biking. <laughs> said they were only good at CrossFit. <clears throat> we'll just I, I'm not I'm not um, I'm not going down that that rabbit hole. Where do. where did he say that? <clears throat> I'm not tracking on it. He said it on our Russian podcast, and then it was translated with AI to let people know that. Um, if they do program more that way, then the leaderboard would be way different, which I do agree with. I don't know if I agree with his specific targets <laughs> that he had <laughs> within that conversation. Fuck. Um, He's just fucking spending the whole off season just <clears throat> roasting people. It's great. Yep. Um, it'd be interesting to see if he gets roasted um, <laughs> if they program traditional CrossFit. Okay, so um, we don't, talk about this enough we do talk about it but i don't think we talk about it enough and i think the community doesn't talk about it anywhere near enough so the way that i think i'd open the conversation is when we talk about damper setting on a rower um a lot of what we're saying is like like our resident rowing coach here at misfit gym portland and misfit athletics chris basically makes fun of me by saying like you're you moving the damper up to a five is basically saying that you don't have good rowing technique like if you have to rely <laughs> on that then it's band-aid for bad is, form it, exactly band-aid for bad form um i think it's easier to sell that because of the complexity of it whereas on a concept two bike like i mean you kind of got to fuck up bad like you got to set the seat way too low um, or move the handles in the wrong direction based on the intensity um, to, I don't know, have technique really be like an issue. Um, but the damper setting and your RPMs are so similar and so incredibly important. And if we know that this machine is not going to show up in the sport specifically, the idea of cranking that damper up and going at a low RPM is as antithetical to improving yourself over the course of the off season as you can possibly. We're get. now referring to a C2 bike, correct? Not a rower. Yes. We're, yeah. We're talking about the concept two bike. Um, so people are going to be like, what the fuck are you talking about? Um, or some Harder is better. Anyways, definitely not my athletes. Um, I want people living between 90 and 95 RPMs for the most part on the bike. Um, a lot of instances will require something closer depending on the drag factor on your bike to like an 85 to 95. So we could open it up, um, sort of to that window, but there is a reason why like all of the biking that actual bikers do is around that RPM, that they're changing the gear to get to that point so that they can be as efficient as possible. It's no different than strokes per minute 
on a rower. It's no different than strides per minute on running. There is a sweet spot for efficiency that either doesn't push you into relying solely on your cardiovascular system or your musculature to do that. We need to find that sweet spot when it comes to this stuff. Um, so when you're getting on the C2 bike and you are relying on a higher damper and a lower RPM for a single effort, you won't see the translation from that to the sport that you actually do in the way that you want to. Like in a lot of instances, I think athletes have to start potentially at a little bit of a lower pace to train their body to get there. It's the one step backwards to take two steps forward situation. But most of the athletes that post their screens um, that haven't been listening to us talk about this are, well, I mean, a lot of times in the 70s on their RPMs, which is very similar to, you know, a six, seven damper on a longer row and having that super low strokes per minute. Great way to accumulate waste. Yes. <laughs> and not teach your body how to get rid of it. Like that's, that's Lots one thing that, that's, that's really lost there. So something to keep in mind with this amount of volume on the C2 bike, it's incredibly important that you sort of hone in on how that works. And one thing that blows my mind games level athletes are not paying attention to this bike is different than this bike. So I'm going to adjust the damper so that my RPMs get me the desired calories per hour or one K split. They will say no matter what I, I bike on a four, even though, I mean, the variance from bike to bike is absurd like same RPMs on a different bike, you could be talking about 40 watt difference. The exact, what you would assume is the exact same speed has that much play to it. So you don't bike on a specific damper. You bike at an RPM that gets you the desired pace that you want. And that requires while you're warming up, moving the damper around. Like I have to, I either have to get the same bike for my zone two work here that I always do, or I have to do that during my warm up. I have to play around with what, what those things are. Um, and there's again, a ton of variants. So something to start to think about when you get on a different bike, make sure that you are okay today. I want to hold a 152 and I want to be between 85 and 90 RPMs the entire time. Like it's just moving the damper around and seeing what that looks like while you're warming up. You can also ultimately like the bike will can do that for you. If you go into its settings and learn about the drag factor on the Correct. rower or the yes the rower or the c2 bike just a quick youtube that'll that's basically how those machines compensate for variable calibration that occurs from machine to machine and even like things like atmospheric variables like air density and stuff like that will come into play so that is the largest self on complaint from the endurance community about the concept to bike is that too much variance well it's not necessarily the variance it's the floor so like i'll if you give instructions to an athlete who's sort of at the beginning of their journey it's not possible for them to hold that high of an rpm at that Is low it? of a wattage so if you tell like, them to go at 90 and they're supposed to be doing their zone two at 90 watts 90 even on a one damper on a lot of bikes is going to be like 120 watts so they can't oh, I do see. That. It's too much. It's not possible. Exactly. So what we tell high. people in that instance is damper stays on one and you go like your linear progression is going to be more about your, your, um, RPMs than anything. Yeah. And I mean, not to, not to be disrespectful to anybody who's in that boat, but that's like, that's a relative, that's either an extreme novice on that machine. Like I've never biked before or, or used a stationary bike like that, or that's somebody whose fitness level is you know, I would say below it's also somewhat gender specific as well. Sure. <clears throat> yeah. Body weight comes into play quite a bit when it comes to, to what you're going to get for wattage and something like that. Um, all right, moving on to talk about some of the strength work. If I was going to, if I had enough time and I was going to write a back squat program for a power lifter, an Olympic weightlifter, a beginner, a crossfitter, a competitive crossfitter, if I had time to be able to do high rep 
for a cycle and then Texas method for a cycle and then heavy as fuck for a cycle. I would do that for all of those people. Like spending the time getting your legs under you and then I think Texas method is a bit of a hybrid of those two ideas. Um, you know, you're doing a five rep max every week, but you're also doing 25 pretty fucking heavy reps. So it's heavy and, um, it's, you know, a, a dose of volume for sure. And then we get into, you know, a bit more of the triples and doubles and singles and that sort of thing. Um, shit, man, just works. It always works. (laughs) <laughs> like if you back squat once a week high rep and then you do twice a week with texas method and you go two or three times a week fairly heavy over the course of you know that typically works out to 20 to 25 weeks of of progressing through back squats you're gonna get a lot stronger like yeah, i don't even i don't even know what else to say sounds like <laughs> constantly varied functional movements executed at high intensities it is it is and it nice. works that's approved. So we're going to do it. Um, one thing, <laughs> You're really doing one a thing that's a little program. bit, thank you. Uh, one thing that's a little bit of a wrinkle this year on the high volume is that last set's going to be an AMRAP. It's not going to be 10. I'm so sorry. You don't get to go 10, me. 10, 10. You get to go 10, 10, and then as many as possible. Um, I will give a shout out to, to Kyle Moline. Kyle, don't do that. Don't do as many as possible. No one do needs it, to Kyle. see you do, do 39 do reps it. of back squat. No, no one needs to see you do, do 39 it. reps of back squat at 65% again. Um, Dude, I'm, so. I'm convinced that's how I <laughs> fucked up my knees the first time is that I did a, a max rep set of like 40 reps. It, it was that weird weight where it's like the only reason you can't like keep doing it is because like your traps hurt and your back is pumped out, but you will be able to stand the squat up if you yeah. like care about hurting yourself enough and i cared about hurting myself enough so i hurt myself right yeah i mean you're the you bring the fucking marine shit to this situation and the like one foot in front of the other like i'll stand here until i can do another squat that's not really traditional strength work there's a reason why underneath amrap it says do not exceed, do not 20, exceed reps 20 reps in an amrap Thank set you. because someone like hunter will be take it very seriously that you know like, can I do one more rep? That's the only question every single time. Down up, yeah. can I do one more? Down up, can I do one more? Sure. Let's I'm go both for an another. idiot and my physiology allows me to <laughs> do those percentages for lots of reps. So. Dangerous duo. Yeah, dangerous Very nice. combination. Very nice. Um, as affiliate coaches, I would like one of you or both of you to sell me on the tempo pull squat snatch for seven weeks. We're going to have about 34 videos coming out with Ted's going to shoot them. (laughs) They're all literally just someone going super slow until the third pull. the gun down. (laughs) I mean. Why? Sure. Why? It fucking works. People don't realize that in order to do something skill-based, you need to know how to do the fucking skill. Slowing you down allows you to focus on the positions you need to be in in order to do it correctly. If you don't know how to move around a barbell, which is the sport of Olympic weightlifting, you're not going to get fucking good at it. doesn't matter if you deadlift 600, squat 500, and press 9,000. If you can't fucking learn how to move around a barbell correctly, you aren't going to get better at the lift. So it be something we trialed at the affiliate level, and you know I don't know how many percents of people got better at that, but over 50% of the people who did the phase got better at said lift. I think I want to say it was probably like 70% of the folks who did that phase improve their snatch simply from the fact because they finally went light enough to learn how to do the movement correctly. Um, And then the only other thing I would say is really important there is that most people in the sport of CrossFit don't understand what a first pull is in the Olympic lifts. They think it's yank the bar off the ground as hard as possible, and that usually leads to a dog shit lift. So slowing them down and making them go light works really well at getting them to understand how to do the skilled movement of the snatch or the clean and jerk. It's the most complicated lift in the world. And based on my (laughs) argument I had from a couple months ago, one of, I would say one of like the top three to five most technical, like single, single physical movements that you can do as like an athlete in any sort of sport. Um, Like, and it's one of, 
how how many movements are on the movement tracker that we use you know 100 say one out of even 50 let's say there's 50 different movements we want you to be good at all 50 of them and oh by the way one of them is the single most complicated lift complex barbell movement on the planet like what in god's name could you possibly give you the idea that doing that heavy Load all the up. time is going to teach you how to do that movement correctly not so, have to feel same it same way that anybody same way that anybody at a high level learns to play a complicated song on the guitar or on the piano or something like that it's done slowly and you shred like, day one com- yeah it's like slowly <laughs> and broken <laughs> down <laughs> like part by part and component by component and only as we get proficient at those individual components do we start to put everything together and even then we haven't even added the speed element yet and just treating the movement like a skill session thinking about it like a hey i'm learning how to do something not i'm getting stronger because there is like i don't know i don't know how many people listening to this podcast would actually quote get stronger or more powerful by doing a squat snatch but it's way less than you think like to me especially for a crossfitter a squat snatch is and even that's redundant a you know an expression of a certain level of strength coordination accuracy power speed all of those things combined into one kind of symphony of a singular movement but like what i didn't say is like 90 percent of it is how strong you are it's like no, we have the coordination element. We have the timing element, the, the accuracy element. There's obviously strength, speed, and power involved in that. But those are only realized when the lift is done correctly. And everybody, anybody who's ever hit a very heavy lift where all of those things clicked knows what we're talking about. And the fact that that happens so rarely is a nod to the fact that like, Hey, it, it's not because you haven't done enough of those heavy reps. It's because you haven't done enough of those perfect reps. So are you saying that if in the program we back squat and we press and we deadlift heavy and then we work on our Olympic lifts, things might go better later on in the year? Why don't I you fucking it. try it? Why don't right. you fucking try it? I didn't, I didn't think that would work. Um, okay, so when we move into... Um, these next few lifts, there's what we call a GPP rotation. Um, so there's multiple categories in which we could program weightlifting. We could make you work on technique. We could have you do high rep sets. We could have you do speed sets. We're trying to get you to move the bar as fast as possible. We could have you go very heavy. Um, and each lift like gets a little bit more out of different categories. Um, when it comes to the Olympic lifts, um, we typically lean more on positional work, volume for direct translation to the sport and going heavy. Um, so when you're, when you're looking at a GPP squat clean, which you'll have, um, within hatchet off season one, that's what that rotation is going to look like. But because we are at the point that we are in the season, we are going to bias positional work. So you're going to notice that you're going to be asked to do things like pause at the power position, pause at the mid thigh, pause at the knee. Um, when it comes to these things more often than we ask you to do the other categories, when we move on to the bench press, um, Uh, we don't have positional technique like stop halfway down on the bench press you can start to see how certain things rely on on different methods a little bit more um and although i can say that i've i've hit the j cup enough times that i might need a positional uh you should have came to class yesterday guy i could have taught you i could have taught you that was my fucking day i had to stare at the sun instead um in crossfit (laughs) uh Pressing endurance is incredibly important. Your ability to continue to do the thing over and over in the part of your body that has significantly less slow twitch muscle fibers. Um, So that's why in the bench press, we would bias the volume side of things. Um, So you'll be doing drop sets where you're trying to press as fast as you can. We'll go heavy once in a while, but we will bias volume. Um, Last but not least, um, one thing that works really well without tanking your central nervous system is the Texas method variation of the deadlift. Um, it's pretty unique. It's on paper, a bit underwhelming. Um, 
but every other week you do a five rep max deadlift, um, which I think we can say would move the needle. What's interesting about works. it is on the in-between weeks, um, so you find your five rep max in week one. Week two, you're just going to do one set of five at 90% of that. And essentially what we're looking for is if we back off 10%, which is actually fairly sizable amount um, when it comes to the deadlift. You know, if you're dropping, if you deadlift 400 to 500 pounds, you're dropping 40 to 50 pounds there. Can we increase the technique and speed at something that's still very challenging? And typically the answer is yes. Um, and don't be scared off by 90%. 90% is 90% of your five rep max, not of your one rep max. So it is again, like the a weight that is, that is pretty manageable for a set of five. Um, of course, we don't just ask you to pull that cold. We give you some ideas on how you would warm up for that. Um, but it's something that allows us to continue to grease the groove while we are locked in on some other things before going a bit heavier and hatch it off season two. Um, I'm going to go super rapid fire here. Um, if you are, so all the lifts that we just talked about, that's everyone. Strength bias track, conditioning bias track, those five lifts and the accessories that are associated with them, you're all doing that, like every single person. The strength bias athletes will also power clean, strict press, lunge, front squat, and hang power snatch. So it's talking about 10 lifts a week, um, which is going to affect your nervous system in a way that honestly, for very many athletes would not be appropriate, even at a high level to do more than one conditioning piece. Um, we want you to be able to go in and really lock in on these things. And then we're going to tell you which conditioning piece to go in and do. Um, and while it's probably while it is potentially going to take you a little bit more time, um, it's, it's very manageable in terms of the actual volume that you're going to be doing. Um, we could, get into, I mean, you guys can talk about a little bit if you want, we could get into what you can look for on the conditioning bias track. Um, but, uh, macro level view, you will be doing two of the three columns daily Metcon interval or bitch work. Like that's about as straightforward as it gets. That's we bias conditioning by having you do more conditioning. We've alluded to the fact that there is some a very high level of simplicity so that we can nail the stimulus for a wider range of athletes when it comes to metcons and intervals. And then like so many people listening to this podcast are already following the program, but for athletes that have not followed misfit athletics yet, when you're looking at the bitch work column, you're looking at either sprinting, um, or doing what we would call a build piece, which is very anaerobic repeats. Um, we have our aerobic repeats, which is going to be a little bit longer, a little bit more volume. Clearly, you go slower there. And then again, conditioning track is going to have an MF2 or zone two run every single week. So um, I don't think it's necessary to, to call out any more specifics when it comes to the conditioning. Other than that, we rely on variance and stimulus as king. I'm just going to, I'll just add if for. I think a, an interesting way to think about the conditioning. So we internally have, we call them columns because we're looking at a they spreadsheet, are. like an Excel <laughs> spreadsheet or a Google sheet. Um, Metcon intervals and bitch work. But I actually would, as like an athlete, almost have you think of them in the other direction as bitch work is kind of the found, most foundational of the three because it allows you to train all of the things that we talk about, we can we can modify the stimulus by changing the time domains. We can I can fuck your legs up by saying bike run run bike. I can I can achieve a stimulus an upper body bias stimulus with a with you know ski row or some combination of the two. But more frequently, we're gonna uh, we're gonna manipulate the stimulus by just varying the time domains and rest periods to allow you to go harder or slower based on you know, what, what we've, what we've chosen for the day and what the rotation looks like, but that is kind of how you build foundational fitness. Um, the, basically the ability to do the sport. The next step is kind of the interval where we can, we start to blend the combination of conditioning on the other end of the spectrum and bitch work. So we have, and also there's obviously rest. So you can one, 
manipulate your strategy from round to round and two the intensity there allows you to blend again the fitness that you're gaining from the bitch work that you're doing but will typically also have you know crossfit elements in it uh, as far as you know thruster wall ball burpee all those sorts of things um so interval is kind of like that second stop and then the metcon is it is sort of like that's sport that's our that's the you know metcons are the sport of crossfit that's where we see you know that's where open workouts land that's where quarterfinals workout lands or workouts land understanding that yeah some of those tests are written as intervals and that's fine as well but we don't often see you know one minute max effort on this thing rest five minutes in a quarterfinals or you know crossfit specific test those are excellent training tools that you would see in you know bitch worker in intervals but when it comes to metcons ultimately you are using the fitness you've gained from bitch work the i athlete iq you've gained from interval work and are putting that into play in the kind of more sport specific column so to speak that is your metabolic conditioning the five rounds for time the three rounds for time the amrap 15 minutes where you know the sport of crossfit lives my only thing that I'd like to add to what you're saying, Hunter, just in like general with what Discord provides you is that if you're not sure you're barking up the right tree, you don't know if you're on the right path, look in the community, look at Discord, look at the scores that you see, look at the time domains, look at the notes that are provided. So if you're someone who's brand new, you get inoculated to the culture really quickly. And if you're someone who's coming back or just starting to get you know redialed in for a new year, look at the programming look how you're performing and see how it aligns with everyone else. I think that's a really valuable tool that's underutilized by folks to make sure that they are indeed not blunting their fitness gains because they're hard headed. Agreed. Um, one, one thing that, that we try to do within our program is um, like the, the, the best situation would be if we could magically remote coach every athlete. We could help you make choices. We could help you clean up your movement, um, that sort of thing. And when we get an idea, the type of idea that starts to spread within the remote coaching community, both the coaches and the athletes, um, and it seems to really be sort of a new way to move the needle, um, we try to put that within, try to find a way to put that into the program for the masses. Um, so one thing that you're going to notice that that reads a little bit different just day to day in the layout of the program is I started telling you which accessory movement goes with which lift. Um, and I think that that's important for a few different reasons. I think from a psychological aspect, like it is, I know some coaches make it the left most columns, like the first thing the athlete would read in their spreadsheet, um, because it lives like off screen. It's like, it, you know, Harry Potter living under the stairs, like afterthought, like you're over here, like you're fine. Um, and I think both coaches and athletes and the way that people read the program, like we ask you to do a lot. We ask you to make some choices and the fatigue of those two things, makes you arrive at the accessory work like fucking what am i am i gonna do this today like am i gonna really like lean in and and do my you know my ghd sit-ups or my farmer's carries or like you know single dumbbell overhead carry whatever it is um so what i wanted to do is show you like hey i want to get better at back squat or power clean or squat snatch or strict press I think that this accessory movement specifically is going to help you move the needle there. Um, and that's how you should decide whether you are going to do that or not. Um, so talk about no check boxes, no going through the motions. Like we don't want you to add 30 to 45 minutes to your session. The guy said so like it's on the teleprompter. I'm going to read it Ron Burgundy style. No, look at the strength movement and ask yourself based on the rest of the day and the way that I'm thinking about my programming, do I need to move the needle here or do I put more eggs into the actual strength piece itself? The conditioning piece is today a day that I'm doing my skill work um, and I need to be careful there. So you will notice that there, that in, in each lift, um, 
that there is an A and a B and the A is typically the lift and B is typically the accessory to show you this is intended to help you specifically with this thing. Um, and thus far, I think it's had both a physiological and psychological change with a lot of the athletes that I work with. Um, like I'm not going to ask you to decide on your own, um, as a remote client, whether you should be doing this or not. Um, which again can happen just because like, if I got to scroll to see this shit and I got to do all this other stuff, like, okay, cool. Sure. You're muted. Fuck. I am. Bless you. <laughs> you're not now. Yeah. Part, <laughs> part of me was just like, if, if you're, trying to do these things like yeah yes you can scroll over but you know realize that if i put on the teleprompter that has value like i think the important part here is that like every time you go into the gym you need to have a very clear-cut plan on are the things that you're about to do making sense for your goals and if you have a remote coach that you and the remote coach are on the same wavelength when that happens so you're not trying to guess you know does he want me to do this does he not want me to do this i really think it's really important that that those plans, plans are laid out really clearly, so there's no guesswork here. And I think that the the change in the accessory work that relates to the lift is going to make a big difference for folks if you treat it the way you're supposed to. And if you really are trying to move the needle on some of these things, like you can't think of them as afterthoughts. Like, oh, it'd be nice if I get this in, or I'm just going to cram this together in EMOM. Like, that's that ain't the way to do it. So final thoughts today, we're going to go with a prompt of giving advice to an athlete. So you can take it in the direction that you want in relation to, is it advice because quarterfinals just ended? Is it advice on hatchet off season one? Is it advice on their entire off season? Um, but I think you guys know enough athletes who have just finished their season um, and are signing up to, to fucking do it all over again um, to have some, some insight into what could help them. Do less, but do it better. I think that's the motto for off season one and two, and that would extend into the season as well. So if you are trying to do too much, you are blunting your own growth and you need to understand that you're in your own way and you have to get out of your own way, set your ego aside and do the things that actually move the needle. Not I did a through F or piece one through seven because everybody else did. Um, I'll give two, two pieces of advice. Um, the first is kind of back to my original s statement about, you know, kind of basically taking a little bit of a break. I think there's a lot to be gained in, and this is part, I oftentimes talk about this in like relation to my own personal experience. Uh, I've been learning how to play golf for a while now and like as frustrating as that has been in a similar vein to someone you know learning how to squat snatch in the gym um the skill acquisition that i've gained and learning how to move my body in a way that i've never really had to aside from maybe playing hockey that's the closest most similar thing i've had to do to to golfing um and because i i have like an analytical kind of mindset where I'm trying to like apply what I'm learning to other areas of my life, like learning and playing the regularly learn and play new sports aspect of CrossFit is, is one of the more frequently overlooked ones. And for athletes who spend, you know, 11 out of 12 months or whatever it is grinding in doing CrossFit, let's remember that there's an element of CrossFit that does lend itself to making you fitter. And that's learning and doing things that aren't probably going to be tested in the open. Like that'd be fucking sick. If Dave Castro was like nine iron for distance, I'm like, yo, what's up? Wish, like, here we go. Like, um, bro, I can skull a nine iron, like 200 <laughs> yards. <laughs> 300 yards four foot apex just stuff why'd you tell me to choose that club just and fucking on another hole now thanks a lot a, just a fucking laser um so it's it's you know basically like now that now that quarterfinals are done take a little bit of time whether in in if that is if that is for you staying in the gym and just doing things that you're you enjoy doing that aren't necessarily stress inducing that would be my recommendation for that and then my second one uh which i was thinking about when Sherb was making his previous comments, but are basically the same thing is that you didn't, you, your goals were not 
achieved this this year not because you didn't do enough work it's not because you didn't it's not because you did, couldn't handle the volume of the open or the volume of quarterfinals it's probably because the intensity at which you trained at wasn't able to put you high enough on the leaderboard to get where you wanted. And I'm also not assume I'm not going to just blanket say everybody didn't achieve what they wanted to this year. Cause that's silly too. But the point was, is that like you moving the needle is not going to be a result of you just doing way more. It's like, well, this is what happened this year. If I do more shit this year, then I'm going to do better. More does not, more often than not does not yield that better result better yields a better result so a bit of a peek behind the curtain one thing that's incredibly important when it comes to programming is um objectives that lead to more objectives that sort of kind of go together and flow within an off season so when i'm the, the very first thing that i do um when starting over essentially is there's no like week one day one doesn't exist that it, it's not even like theoretically possible until we know the plan for hatchet off season one hatchet off season two phase zero phase one phase two open prep quarterfinals prep like we need things to build on one another to lead us forward um we're not trying to stomp you into a hole over the course of these seven weeks and then be like, okay, now what? I'm nowhere near, um, you know, the the date of which, you know, I'm going to be tested for these things. And there's something to an athlete giving in to that longer timeline that would allow them to actually like excel over the course of an entire off season and make changes. So like, a lot of what you guys touched on was this idea of um, intensity and intensity. Once again, you know, something we talked about a lot can be intensity of focus. Um, there's an intensity in a weird way that you could bring to patients where you're very disciplined and kind of locked into what you do one step in front of the other. Um, but we need to be able to see that we're making these tiny incremental changes over the course of an entire off season. And if I'm like, just, I love that someone would be geared up Monday, April 29th to like get after it, but not having the mindset of when I'm choosing rep schemes and paces on machines and certain things, um, sets I'm going to do in my muscle up sets, how, you know, I'm, I'm letting myself go over 180 minus my age and my, my MF2 run, whatever it is. If we start there, there's no place to go. And if we start with more of the like back to basics, beginner mindset and, and think like, wow, I could get, if I got this much better in these seven weeks and then that much better. And I did that over the course of the entire off season, like I had a, I had a conversation with a prospective remote coaching client slash coach and big goals for someone who's just getting started in the sport. So what I do in a lot of those instances, I go find an athlete that like seven years ago, their games profile has them in 10,000th or 20,000th place. And then last year they made it to semifinals finally. Um, and think about what that took. Seven fucking years of just getting after it. And, and not only giving in to the idea of what I could accomplish in an off season, but what I could accomplish in multiple off seasons. And we start to do the math on that stuff. It's one second faster here on a split, one second faster there, two and a half pounds added to this lift, five pounds added to that lift and done continuously. It's like, we'll have in a hatchet off season two, we'll talk about how to tackle Texas method. Like, are you going to find a new five, an actual new five rep max seven weeks in a row? Like if you're a beginner, maybe, but like if you torch yourself week one, come on, Jesus, right? Like you're, you're in deep fucking trouble. So having that mindset, that macro view of what we could accomplish over the entire year, if you found that balance between intensity and patience, um, man, you could really make a change. You could do like a lot of those athletes. There's a tipping point. You see them like slide up the leaderboard, slide up the leaderboard, and then it's like, holy fuck, they went from 10,000th to like 1,200th in an off season. And I can guarantee you 
they did not fucking Kool-Aid man their way through a wall on April 29th in the off season and see if they can sustain that over the course of the whole year. They bought into things like mobility and skill progressions and adding a little bit of weight each time they lift. And like, I'm not going to be worried about my triple backflip, double under, triple under with six ropes in my hands before I'm really good at double unders and wall balls and deadlifts and power snatches and things of that nature. Got to play the long game. You get that enthusiasm, that, that, that excitement of getting back into it. That's great. We love that, but you got to stretch it out. It's like a way longer version of pacing yourself in a Metcon. Like, can you take that enthusiasm and sprinkle it around the year as opposed to like the three of us get out there and do a 21, 15, nine, and you can't even fucking see me on that 21. And then I lose by six and a half minutes on the workout. Now one's a lot matters. 400 on the marathon. It's a good idea. Fuck yeah, it is. That's what I did. It worked out well. Can we do it? <laughs> yeah. That's it. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Misfit Podcast. Make sure you head to either teammisfit.com or misfitathletics.com before Monday, April 29th to get started on your affiliate programming or hatchet off season one. If you are wondering whether you should do, if you want an objective view of whether you should do the strength bias track or the conditioning bias track, head to discord.gg forward slash misfit athletics. Get yourself into our free community. Let's talk about it. You can ask other misfits that did something similar last year. You can ask us. We'll dig into and help you figure out what it's going to be. Um, and don't be mad at us when we tell you that it is the conditioning bias track. I'm also just going to say the strength bias track is no fucking joke. So um, congratulations on choosing that. And um, It's the one I'm doing. <laughs> That That's what I need. I'm Hunter's doing the conditioning need. bias track. Yeah. yeah, he needs it. I did the accessory bias track. <laughs> Fuck golf accessory. The golf Thank accessory. you for listening, especially if you're still listening right now. We'll see you next week. Peace.